Welcome to AP Biology. This video is on cell communication. Cell communication is essential for both multicellular and unicellular organisms. It allows one cell within the body to transmit information to another cell. This is done to coordinate activities like muscle contraction, and it's also used to regulate activities within the body. Cells are going to communicate with each other using chemical signals called ligands. The technical name for a cell communication pathway is a signal transduction pathway. And it's a series of steps by which a signal on the cell surface, which we call a ligand, is converted into a specific cellular response. The cell in which the cellular response is generated is called the target cell. There's two types of signaling that can take place. We have local signaling and we have long distance signaling. In local signaling, information is sent across a very small distance. Here you see two examples of local signaling. We see paracrine signaling and we see synaptic signaling. In paracrine signaling, we have a cell called a paracrine gland, which you see right here release a chemical messenger that we call a local regulator over a very short distance. This is usually released into local tissues and it's going to affect all nearby target cells. It's going to cause the target cells to have a response. One important local regulator within the body is the growth factor. Growth factors are going to be a chemical signal that causes target cells to go through cell division. This might be released in order to cause um, a part of your body to be repaired due to damage, or it can cause growth in a particular area of the body. Another example of local signaling is synaptic signaling. This takes place in the nervous system where a neuron is communicating to its target cell it releases a ligand, a chemical messenger called a neurotransmitter. And that neurotransmitter is released into a small space that we call the synapse. So you see it's only traveling a very short distance. In long distance signaling, we have cells called endocrine cells or endocrine glands that release chemicals called hormones. These hormones are released into the bloodstream. Since they're released into the bloodstream, they travel throughout the entire body and they cause responses in their target cells. There are three stages to a signal transduction pathway. Step one is reception. Step two is transduction. Step three is the response. We begin with reception. We have the signaling molecule bind to a receptor on the cell membrane of the target cell. This signaling molecule can be a local regulator if it's released by a paracrine gland. It could be a neurotransmitter if it's released by a neuron. Or it could be a hormone if it's released by an endocrine gland. In either case, the chemical messenger, the ligand, is going to bind to a receptor in the cell membrane. This receptor is an integral protein. Once the ligand binds to the receptor, the next stage is transduction. Transduction is when that message is relayed throughout the cell. It's going to be relayed throughout the cell using a series of proteins called protein kinases. I kind of think of it like passing the baton throughout the cell. Finally, this is going to trigger a cell response. With any signal transduction pathway, in order for a cell to respond to the ligand, it needs to have the receptor for the ligand. The response of the cell is going to depend upon the pathway within the cell. Different pathways within the cell trigger different responses in the target cell.
We are going to look more closely at each step in a signal transduction pathway. The first step is reception. Reception is when the ligand or chemical messenger binds to a receptor on the cell membrane. We're going to study three different types of receptors. G protein coupled receptors, receptor tyrosine kinases, and ion channel receptors. The first type of receptor is the G protein coupled receptor. This receptor has a protein called a G protein attached to it. That G protein is normally inactive and it becomes activated when the specific ligand binds to the receptor. An example of a ligand that's going to bind to the G protein coupled receptor is epinephrine. Epinephrine is going to be the ligand that triggers the fight or flight response. Here we see a picture of the G protein coupled receptor. Here you see the G protein which is normally inactive. When the signaling molecule, the ligand, in this case epinephrine, binds to the G protein coupled receptor, it's going to cause the G protein to get activated by GTP. So essentially what is happening here is that the binding of the ligand to the receptor is causing activation of the G protein through phosphorylation. A universal theme within biology is that proteins are activated through the process of phosphorylation. This G protein is going to initiate the process of transduction, passing that message within the cell. Second type of receptor is called the receptor tyrosine kinase. The receptor tyrosine kinase responds to ligands like the growth factor. So the pathways associated with these receptors are going to trigger responses like cell division. Malfunctioning of RTKs is often associated with different uh, types of cancer. Here you see the receptor tyrosine kinase and you can see it's a dimer, it's a protein made up of two polypeptide subunits. When the ligand binds to the receptor, it's going to cause phosphorylation of relay proteins. Again, the relay proteins are going to be activated through phosphorylation. In this case, the phosphorylation comes from ATP. The last type of receptor we'll see is the ligand gated ion channel. These are seen in the nervous system. Some examples of ligand gated ion channels are sodium channels and calcium channels. These are channels which are closed. They have a gate and the key to open the gate is going to be the ligand. The ligand in the nervous system is the neurotransmitter. When the neurotransmitter binds to the ligand gated ion channel, it causes the channel to open and these ions, which can be sodium or could be potassium or could be calcium, are then going to be able to enter or leave the cell. Sometimes receptors are not located on the cell membrane but are located within the cell instead. Chemical messengers that are small or hydrophobic, nonpolar, they're going to pass right through the cell membrane. An example of a hydrophobic or nonpolar chemical messenger is going to be a steroid hormone like testosterone or estrogen. These hormones pass right through the cell membrane and instead bind to receptors within the cell. In the case of the steroid hormone, testosterone, <clears throat> it's going to bind to a receptor that's attached to the nuclear envelope. Once the hormone binds to the receptor, this complex is going to enter the nucleus and function as a transcription factor. A transcription factor is a molecule that is going to initiate the process of protein synthesis. So steroid hormones like testosterone, they control the production of proteins within the cell. That's going to be the cellular response. 
The second stage in a signal transduction pathway is transduction. Uh, during transduction, the message is going to be relayed throughout the cell and is going to lead to a cellular response. The message is usually passed using a series of proteins. These proteins are going to be activated through phosphorylation. The name of those proteins are protein kinases. Protein kinases are going to be responsible for passing the message through the cell using what's called a phosphorylation cascade. Here you see a picture of a phosphorylation cascade. It begins with the signal molecule binding to the receptor. That's going to cause the initial relay molecule to get phosphorylated. It could be a relay protein, it could be a G protein that gets activated. That relay molecule is then going to activate the first protein kinase. And as you can see in this picture, you have a series of protein kinases. They get activated through phosphorylation in a particular order. I kind of think of it as they're passing that phosphate, like they're passing a baton throughout the cell. This is going to transmit that information from one part of the cell to another part of the cell and it's going to lead to a cellular response. Sometimes there are messengers within the cell that are not proteins. Any molecule used to transmit the message within the cell that's not a protein is called a second messenger. Some examples of second messengers are molecules like cyclic AMP, calcium, we're also going to see one called IP3 and another second messenger called DAG. Cyclic AMP is the most widely used second messenger within our body cells. It's created using an enzyme called adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase creates cyclic AMP by taking ATP and cutting off two phosphate groups. This creates cyclic AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Here we see a pathway using cyclic AMP. This pathway utilizes the G protein coupled receptor. We begin with the ligand binding to the receptor. In this case, our ligand is epinephrine. Epinephrine binds to the G protein coupled receptor, which causes the G protein to be activated through phosphorylation. In this case, the source of the phosphate group is going to be GTP. The G protein then phosphorylates another protein. In this case, the protein being phosphorylated is the enzyme adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase takes ATP, cleaves off two phosphates, making cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP works as a second messenger. It's not a protein, but it passes the message throughout the cell. In this case, cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which could then activate another kinase, which can then activate another kinase, all through phosphorylation, eventually leading to some kind of cellular response. Another important second messenger is calcium. Calcium is an important second messenger because the cell tightly regulates its concentration. You can see using active transport, calcium is pumped into the endoplasmic reticulum. It's also pumped into the mitochondria. Since we so effectively control its concentrations, we often use it as a second messenger in signal transduction pathways. Here we also see uh, two other second messengers, one called IP3 and another called DAG. Let's look at a pathway utilizing these second messengers. Here you see a pathway utilizing a G protein coupled receptor. We're going to have a ligand bind to the receptor. This is going to cause the G protein to be activated by GTP which then activates another protein through phosphorylation. In this case, this protein here being activated is called phospholipase C. 
phospholipase C performs a very specific function. It travels to the cell membrane and works on a molecule called PIP2. Phospholipase C cleaves PIP2 in half and it creates two different second messengers, one called IP3 and another one called DAG. Other pathways use DAG. This specific pathway uses IP3. IP3 is a second messenger. It's not a protein, but it's going to transmit the message throughout the cell. In this case, IP3 travels to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and binds to a ligand-gated calcium channel. Binding of IP3 to the channel opens the channel and allows calcium to leave. Calcium then works as a second messenger. It transmits the message throughout the cell, eventually leading to some kind of cell response. You can see that both of these pathways we just looked at use G-protein coupled receptors. Both of these pathways are going to create different responses because each one contains a different transduction pathway within the cell. Different pathways within the cell lead to different responses. Finally, the response, the last stage of the signal transduction pathway. The response is often called the output response. One very common response in the cell due to a ligand is going to be activation of genes leading to the production of proteins within the body. There are many different chemical messengers that initiate the process of protein synthesis. In this diagram here, we see the growth factor. We know that the growth factor is a local regulator. The growth factor is a polar molecule. It's a protein, and it's going to bind to a receptor on the cell membrane. Binding of the growth factor to the receptor initiates transduction. Here we see our phosphorylation cascade. The last protein that gets activated enters the nucleus and is going to activate a transcription factor. We know that transcription factors activate genes. They turn genes on. They begin the process of transcription, which leads to the production of proteins within the cell. We know that growth factors stimulate the process of cell division. And you can see here, they also stimulate the process of growth through the manufacturing of proteins. Another important ligand that is going to activate genes are going to be steroid hormones like testosterone and estrogen. The difference between testosterone and estrogen is that they enter the cell membrane. They go right through the cell membrane, which you can see in this picture right here, and they bind to receptors within the cell. Once they bind to receptors within the cell, they enter the nucleus and activate genes leading to the production of proteins. So a major difference between a growth factor and a steroid hormone is that a growth factor is polar, so it binds to receptor on the cell membrane, where a steroid hormone is nonpolar, so it goes through the cell membrane and binds to a receptor within. Here you see the pathway um, caused by epinephrine. Epinephrine is kind of a unique ligand because it works as both a neurotransmitter in the nervous system, which is a form of local communication, and epinephrine also functions as a hormone in the endocrine system. We commonly call epinephrine adrenaline. You see that epinephrine binds to a G protein coupled receptor that initiates a transduction pathway. We see a phosphorylation cascade take place. And here you see the response that the liver has to epinephrine. In the liver, epinephrine causes glycogen, which is a polysaccharide, to be broken down into glucose. The liver will then flood the bloodstream with glucose. Here you see an important signal transduction pathway that takes place in yeast. This pathway is going to lead to the production of a structure called a shmu. Here you see a shmu in this picture. It's a projection off of the yeast 
and it's going to allow yeast cells to be able to fuse and mate with each other. The chemical signal released by the yeast is called the mating factor. The mating factor is like a pheromone because it's a hormone released from the body, from the yeast. It's going to bind to a G protein coupled receptor on the yeast cell membrane. This causes a G protein to be activated by GTP, which begins a phosphorylation cascade, which begins transduction. Here we see the end result. The response is going to be the creation of actin. We know that actin microfilaments form the cortex underneath the cell membrane. The cortex under the cell membrane gives a cell its shape. By producing more actin, we're able to, or the yeast is able to change its shape and produce this structure called a shmu that it needs to meet. Cells have the ability to fine-tune a response. Fine-tuning can take place through four actions. One is amplification of the signal. Two is specificity of the response. Three is efficiency of the response. Four is termination of the signal. Here we see specificity of the response. You can see in these diagrams here that these pathways all utilize the same receptors here, but they lead to different responses. They lead to different responses because they have different transduction pathways associated with the receptor. So whether or not a cell has a receptor dictates whether or not the cell can respond to the ligand. But the pathway within the cell is going to dictate the response that the cell has to that ligand. Here you can see that different pathways lead to different responses. The transduction pathway also has the ability to amplify the signal. Enzyme cascades amplify the cell's response. The number of activated products is much greater than the preceding step. So you have one protein kinase activate two, two kinases activate four, four kinases activate eight, eight kinases activate 16. So you can see as the cell goes through the phosphorylation cascade, with each step a greater number of proteins become phosphorylated, amplifying the response within the cell. So you can have a very small amount of ligand create a very large cellular response. The efficiency of the response is increased using relay proteins. I'm sorry, using scaffolding proteins. These scaffolding proteins that you see right here hold all the relay proteins, all the protein kinases in one location. This is going to keep all these proteins that are associated with the pathway in one location in order to help that pathway work more efficiently. Finally, the response of the target cell is going to end when the receptor no longer has a signal bound to it, no longer has a ligand bound to it. One important response that cells often have is called apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed or controlled cell death. During apoptosis, the components of the cell are chopped up through the process of hydrolysis. This is done using hydrolytic proteins like proteases. Each individual cell part is located or is placed inside of a vesicle. These vesicles are then taken in through white blood cells called scavenger cells and are broken down and are digested. Here we see the signal transduction pathway leading to apoptosis. Several different factors can trigger apoptosis, but one of those factors is going to be the release of a death signal. The death signal binds to a receptor on the cell membrane and initiates a phosphorylation cascade. 
this phosphorylation cascade is going to lead to the activation of hydrolytic enzymes. Enzymes like proteases that break down proteins and enzymes like nucleases that break down nucleic acids. There are several different reasons why a cell might go through apoptosis. One is normal development. During development, apoptosis selectively kills particular cells within the body. Here you can see the development of the fingers or the digits of the hand. You can see that the entire hand starts off with a very webbed structure and during embryonic development the webbing in between the fingers is reduced. These cells selectively die during different parts of development through the process of apoptosis. So death signals will be released in these tissues that cause those cells to die which is going to lead to the creation of the individual digits during embryonic development. Apoptosis can also be triggered by DNA damage in the nucleus. This is going to prevent things like cancer from forming. And apoptosis can also be triggered by a misfolded protein. We know that misfolded proteins can lead to several diseases, diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So it's important that the body um, kill any cell that can potentially have a problem that can be life-threatening to the organism as a whole.